Hello, I want to help Mr. Harinda Singh and Sikh Research Institute for giving me this opportunity to share my work with you. The title of today's presentation is called From Landowners to Taxi Drivers. I just want to begin um, with a word on the title of the presentation. As the description of the program states, the focus is really on the American side of the story. I am not talking about the gradual transformation of the immigrants from rural settings to that post-industrial society. The word landowners offers a background to the place that the immigrants are coming from. That's not analyzed in this lecture. I picked that up more with my current project on the same group of immigrants, and I will mention that at the end. So the goal for today's presentation is the following. To offer a glimpse into the lives of immigrant sick taxi drivers in New York City. The focus will be on the immigrants' race and social class, and that will continue as a theme throughout this process. And I'll be drawing mostly from my book called Punjabi Immigrant Mobility, published by Palgrave Macmillan in, in 2012. So the question for us is, I'd like to situate it a little bit broadly, that why ask the question, right? So why study immigrant South Asian yellow taxi drivers, and then why look at sick immigrant cabbies? First, why study immigrant South Asian yellow cabbies? There are a few reasons. One, that there's too much focus on the middle class. And this focus of the research and the popular imagination, I think, has been on the middle class of uh, Indian Americans and Asian Americans. And to a degree, that is understandable. As a majority of immigrants from India who arrived after the passage of the 1965 Immigration Reform and Control Act were primarily of middle class or what has been referred to as professional people, so like doctors, engineers, scientists, and so on. So to understand who this group is and their patterns of settlement in America is an understandable goal. But there's a larger U.S. racial project that actually focuses on the middle class of South Asian Americans and masks the lower social ca uh, class experience. And um, if you note, you will uh, remember that 1960s is also a time for the civil rights movement. So that's when African Americans were decrying racism and its negative effects on the group. They were challenging legal segregation, protesting to put an end to legal segregation. And it's really in the context that this non-white middle class group came into the spotlight. The basic point of focusing on this group was to deny the existence of racism in the country. So the logic went something like this, that if a middle class minority group exists, and African Americans mostly are not, then that means African Americans are lazy. The middle class Asian Americans, of which Indian Americans and therefore Sikh Americans are a part of, came to be known as, quote unquote, this model minority. And this term actually has its origins in an article published in the New York Times Magazine in 1966. The article was written by William Peterson, and he was a sociologist teaching at UC Berkeley, and his focus was on Japanese Americans. And he touted the good qualities of this group and focusing on that how their good qualities have allowed them to overcome discrimination, and that suggesting that if all groups were to do this, were to work hard, then they would, would not experience racial discrimination. And so there was this less focus on Asian Americans of lower socioeconomic background, including uh, research, actually. It has changed a bit over the years, so there's some changes in the scholarship, but not to the point where the middle class imagination of this group has uh, been erased. So why sick cabbies? One that um, broadly, and not just sick cabbies, the South Asian, and by that mostly I'm talking about people from the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, immigrants from that part, dominated the occupation and they dominated the occupation for about 20 years like mid 1980s to about early 2000 and about 60 percent of yellow cabbies in new york city were of south asian origin and of those who were from india 
it was the Punjabi Sikhs who comprised a majority of the drivers who were um, driving yellow cabbies, or cabs rather. So my focus, therefore, you know, why is this group and how are they fitting into America? How are they adapting? How are they integrating? What is their adaptive trajectory look like? Now the data sources uh, for this project, there were two phases of data collection. One was in 2000 and the other one was in 2008, 2009. I talked with 59 immigrant yellow sick taxi drivers, 10 non-Indian cabbies, eight owners of fleet garages, New York Taxi Workers Alliance, which is a New York based advocacy group for all taxi drivers in New York City commonly referred to as NYTWA, 11 lawyers and or representatives of taxi drivers, one official at the New York Taxi and Limousine Commission. So that's the totality of the people that I spoke with. Now for this presentation, there are three parts to it. I begin by talking about the pre-migration characteristics of the immigrants. And in that, I talk about the education of the immigrants, of themselves, as well as their parents. I talk about their pre-migration employment. I talk about the reasons for the departure, why they left India. Then I move on to talking about the American lives of the immigrants when they come into the United States. And the theme that I really want us to focus on is of race and social class. And that appears from the moment they enter into the country. So I talk about the methods of entry of this group of Punjabi Sikh cabbies that I speak with or spoke with, their employment opportunities post entry into the United States, how they experience America on the streets of New York City, and then the third part of the presentation is just I offer some concluding thoughts about how they are adapting or integrating into the fabric of American society. So beginning with the pre-migration characteristics, I separate the sample into 2000 and 2008-9, the second phase, just as um, the table shows that one person in the second sample did not report their education and three of them were actually not Punjabi six. Focusing on their education, you will note that a majority of them fall in the college degree category and they receive their college degrees in arts. And uh, we see the same for 2008-9 where most of them are college degree people who come to the country and um, most of them have their degrees in arts. Very small in both groups received a master's degree, so graduate degree three in 2002 and 2008-9, and then the rest fall into some college, high school, and then less than education, uh, less than high school education. In terms of uh, their parental education, rather predictably, I think one can see that their mothers had less education than their fathers, and that is the case for both groups that I spoke with in 2000 as well as 2008-9, and the majority of them had less than high school degrees. So majority of the parents of the immigrant sick cabbies that I spoke with had less than a high school degree. Very few had college degrees. What were some of the jobs in which the immigrants were employed in? Varieties of occupations. Some were salesmen, taxi driver, Punjab police, and not necessarily police officers, but driving jeeps or or the vehicles for the for the police, border security force, electricians, agriculture, Punjab electricity board, cashier, dairy farm, business mechanic, and one person was a tailor. And uh, what I also have found with this group is that there is some overlap between working in agriculture and then say working as a mechanic or a tailor. So there's some overlap between agriculture and and farming and some of these other occupations in which they were employed. There were three in the sample who were outliers. So there was the bank manager, Ludiana. There were 
person who was a field officer prior to uh, departing from India. And one was a middle school social studies teacher. All three of them had master's degrees. Now, there was a total of five people with master's degrees, and I say that they outliers because it was a very small proportion. Two of the five actually came to study. One came on a, a student visa, and this person I spoke with in 2000. And here's an excerpt from his interview. A quick word. The interviews were conducted mostly in Hindi Urdu. There were a couple of people who spoke in Punjabi. And the names that I will mention from here on are all pseudonyms. So none of the names are actually their own names, their real names. So here is the person who came from Punjab in 1991. I spoke with him in 2000. And uh, he said, you know, at the time I was 24, I study, but I didn't have a green card. It became expensive to study. Then I started driving taxis. I came on a student visa. I had a master's in mathematics. Then studying was expensive. My parents couldn't afford it. And he described his father as a serviceman who worked in the railways. And so there was no way that, you know, he could afford the son's education abroad, especially. The other person came on a tourist visa. And he says, you know, I came from Louisiana. I've been here for four years. I came in 1996. At the time, I was 28. I came on a visitor's visa, not for work. I came to study. I took admission, but I couldn't continue studies, and so I quit. I took admission in genetics for my PhD, and he was interesting. I spoke to him in 2000 as well. I remember talking to him at one of the delis on 9th Avenue. At the time, that deli was on 18th and 9th, I think, and then now it's like in the 30s or upper 20s on 9th Avenue. Um, and he was very clear about how he was different from the rest of the cab drivers. You know, he was trying to tell me that he really couldn't associate with them. There was really nothing that they had in common to talk to. Um, and so he wanted me to know that he was above their status and he was better than them. There was the bank manager who also I spoke with in 2008-9 and uh, he came because of his friends influenced him to come. He said, you know, I came in 2001 January. Now I'm 45. So I was 42 then. I came for better income. Though it was a better future, I had a good bank job. I was influenced by friends to come and thought I'd try. When I came here, I saw that the atmosphere was good. Every person feels like they want to improve their future. So I decided to immigrate. Although he says that things were good, he was actually the person who inspired me to do the next project because he seemed extremely deeply dissatisfied with uh, having come to the United States. Anyway, so the remaining two with master's degree actually came to work. One I talked with in 2000 and I reconnected with him in 2008-9. Uh, he actually helped me find more uh, informants for my study. And he was still driving a cab. When I talked to him in 2000, he had expressed interest in pursuing a degree um, in uh, a PhD, but uh, obviously it had not materialized. And the other person who came with a master's I spoke with in 2008-9, and he actually um, was, the, was the guy who was a social studies teacher. So why leave Punjab? Three main reasons. One of them is economic considerations. And this is the story of Gurdas. Gurdas left India in 1977, and at the time, he was 16 years of age. His path to the U.S., you notice, is very circuitous. So this is how his journey begins. You know, there were some people in the village who would ride around in motorbikes when they'd return from abroad. We didn't know where they were from. Some would work on the ship for six months and would go around in bikes in India. They'd wear good clothes, so we thought, what's the point of studying? Why not just go abroad? I went to Iran. After six months there, the war began. When I learned a little work there, I had to leave. We took a bus to Afghanistan, till Kabul by road. We paid them until India, Ludhiana Punjab, but Pakistan didn't grant us visa. There were 35 of us. Then from there, we took a flight from Kabul. There were no flights from Iran at the time. We flew from Kabul to Amritsar. I didn't feel like living in the village. Was there for maybe six or seven months? I had a friend in France. He had gone to India for a visit. I told him to make arrangements and take me. He said, get some money. We went to Thailand, Poland, 
stayed in Poland for about 15 or 20 days, then to Belgrade, then to Italy. From Italy, I got a German visa. It was Switzerland, and from there to Germany. The police caught us in Switzerland in a park. We had two cars. It's a small country. Our color is different. There were few of, of us in a car and looked the same. We showed our passports. We had our visas. It was a transit visa. We told them that we were going to eat. Then we went to Germany. The other reason that was cited was corruption. And this is uh, a person that I spoke with in 2008-9. He came in 1985 and he was 43. And so when I talked to him in 2008-9, he was in his mid-60s. And he was actually driving a cab. His partner was his uh, son. So he was driving a taxi with his uh, son. He was an overseer in uh, the electrical board in Punjab. And he talks about that, you know, work there was corrupt. You have to pay bribes and everything. And that motivated him to leave. In the third reason that was cited was uh, political reasons. And this is Manjeet. He came in 1990 when he was 20. And him I spoke with in 2000. He says, you know, I had problems in India. The students in Punjab were facing a lot of problems from the government. I just wanted to avoid that problem. And the innocent were suffering too without any reason. Well, the situation in Punjab, Punjabi started a revolution because they wanted more rights. So the government would arrest students in the college. They would arrest them in cases of strike for no reason. They would write up false reports. They'd hold you in a jail without any reason. This didn't happen to me, but it did happen to people. So my parents were afraid that I was a college-age guy and they didn't want me in any trouble. So how do their American lives kind of progress from there on. What we see with this group of people coming into the United States that they actually used three major immigration laws to en enter the United States and then gain permanency in the US, meaning green cards. So the three major immigration laws are Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, 1965, Immigration Reform and Control Act, ARCA, 1986, Immigration Act of 1990. ARCA, 1965. The avenues that this group of informants used were the following. Paper marriage, and paper marriage meaning contract marriage, where they paid women to marry them. Family sponsorship, like a sibling or a spouse or a parent or um, mostly that, very few um, children. Actually, in the sample, there were no children that sponsored their family members. And then a very small proportion reported that they got their permanent green cards or in the process of it through the employment avenue of IRCA 1965. So here's the example of Sukhwant. Sukhwant is the bank manager. He came in 2001. He said he was 42 at the time, and his marriage was paper marriage, and that's how he got his green card and eventually his citizenship. So I asked him, well, how did you get a green card? Sukhwant, I talked to friends. I got papers like others do. You find out from other people. I met a woman. We became close. Intimacy increased, and so we got married. I got a green card in three or four years, I got the green card in 2006. And what's interesting is that he tells me that the woman he met, he got close to her. And hence, you may see the word actually that he uses. And that's how they got married. Except that his daughter spilled the beans. And he didn't know that. So they were driving me to uh, Jackson Heights uh, subway stop for me to come back. And when the dad went to get his um, car keys, uh, the daughter actually told me, well, as you can see, that our stepmother is not here. And she actually doesn't live with us. The marriage was not a real one. It was one of those paper marriages. And they paid dearly for that marriage. They paid about $25,000. And it was all out of their credit cards that they paid. Um, but that's how I found out that, you know, his marriage wasn't a real marriage. But it was through one of those contract marriages um, with a woman and the process of getting married here and then getting a green card is is a very complex process because he had to divorce his wife in India and then remarry here and then he was able to sponsor his children 
son and daughter and um, I suppose he can remarry his wife after he divorces his uh, current wife um, that he got through uh, the paper marriage so it's a very complex process and when I met him in 2008-9 he was basically functioning like a single father here's Rao and uh, he was one of the non-sick uh, taxi drivers he talks about the process of paper marriage as well. He says, you know, I regularized with paper marriage in uh, 1984. It didn't cost me anything. Now it costs about $25,000. And people uh, often pay $40,000. He's heard this. People regret after coming here. Um, he's met people who have had good jobs in India, and now they regret driving taxis in New York City. So it's obviously the process is not very um, cheap by any means. This is Rajvinder. He came through family sponsorship. His sister sponsored him. And he came in 1993 at the age of 31. He, he came from District Patiala, Punjab at the time. His sister got him a green card, as I said. She was the only sibling in the U.S. Before migration, he worked in the electricity board as a senior engineer for maybe about three or four years. He was selected but didn't really like the job and then started farming. Farming was his own and um, the dairy farm where the family has uh, 45 cows and 50 acres of land and he said that you know I stay here for six months during off season and farm. He doesn't really like to do this split but wants to keep his green card for his children if they want to come for education and he actually split his time between uh, him and his brother. So he stayed here six months, and then he worked on the farm in Patiala, and then his brother came here, worked as a cabbie for six months while he was in Patiala working on the farm. So it, it was split in that way. And there were three people who said that they got their H-1 visas, a green card through employment, and one of them was the person with a master's degree in math. He said he got his uh, sponsorship through the deli where he worked. And there were two more that said that they got their um, green card, although I'm not so sure that they were telling me the truth. One was a gas station attendant and the other one was a cook. And one of them I spoke with in 2000 and the other one in 2008-9. And the reason I don't think they were telling me the truth is because uh, for one of them at least, uh, you know, many years had lapsed. And he still did not have his green card. But they had um, the ability to work in the United States. Presumably they had obtained their um, work permit. And maybe even if it expired, you can actually keep working in the New York taxi industry. Overall, these are the provisions that this group of uh, sick cabbies used of the 1965 Act. Now, the 1965 Act is actually a very interesting act. So, ERCA 1965 was presented as an immigration law that was trying to end racial quotas and racial bars placed on certain people by the 1924 Immigration and Nationality Act. So it was presented as a way to equalize the playing field, let everybody come into the U.S. regardless of race. And the focus here, as you can see, is on family reunification because majority of the openings to enter and then per attain permanency is either through unmarried adult children of U.S. citizens spouses and unmarried children of permanent resident aliens, married children of U.S. citizens, or brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. So family reunification was really the focus. Very few possibilities to come through the work visas, right? So professionals, especially gifted scientists and artists, they actually have a separate category of 10%, but then skilled and unskilled is lumped into one category for 10%. 10, uh, 10%. So unskilled is actually even less. And what's interesting is that on the outset, it looked like it was an effort to make the playing field equal for all races in terms of immigration, but actually not true.
what was assumed is that because, for example, Asian immigration was barred completely by the 1924 Immigration and Nationality Act, so there were very few Asian immigrants. Southern and Eastern European immigration was uh, brought down to a very small proportion by the same 1924 Act. So it was presumed that Asian immigrants would not be able to enter the United States simply because they really did not have a lot of relatives. It was also presumed that people from the third world would not be able to enter the United States through the professional categories, and that's what was primarily needed for labor in the U.S. at the time. That was a surprise. The goal was really to increase immigration from southern and eastern. So on the outset, it looked like uh, race was not a factor, that racism was not a factor, but upon close scrutiny of the Immigration Act, we see that it's actually the opposite. The person who talks about this is David Reimers, and these are just two. There are many more people who write on this, but I have used him extensively for uh, this presentation and for um, some of the arguments that I make in the book as well. So what we see with the Immigration Act is that Congress is trying to balance race and economic interests. So racially, they really don't want non-Europeans to come, but at the same time, there are certain kinds of economic interests that led to creation of possibilities to come here for work. So while they're trying to balance that, what they're doing is creating a context of reception that is not welcoming to people who are non-European, read non-white, uh, but at the same time, there are labor needs that have to be met. Immigration Act of 1986. What we see is that this act was put in place because there was a labor need for Western agricultural growers. So two types of programs were placed here so that that could be possible, raw and saw. Raw is the Replenishment Agricultural Worker Program, and saw the Special Agricultural Worker Program. And then there was the Legalization Program as well, but the goal was also to control undocumented immigration. Read his, so there was this conversation in Congress that, you know, most people who are coming in undocumented come from the third world, they come from poorer countries, so there was this conversation that yeah, people come in and search of better opportunities, but at the same time, there was an effort to make sure that those kinds of people were not allowed to come into the United States easily. So controlling undocumented immigration uh, was a goal. And this was also the act where sanctions were placed on employers for hiring undocumented immigration. Great, right? in order to fulfill the goal of undocumented immigration. However, if one looks at the law and the sanctions closely, there are plenty of loopholes in that provision itself. Essentially, it allows employers to hire undocumented immigrants without really being penalized. So we do see here that economic interests do trump race a bit because there is a need for labor, for cheap labor in the agricultural sector. But at the same time, the same or similar socioeconomic people who would come into the United States primarily from the third world, there's also an effort to stem their flow through this focus on undocumented immigration. But again, at the same time, these employer sanctions allow the group to be hired because the way that the sanctions work, it allows the employers to actually not be completely accountable. So here's Jagdeshwar. He used this act. He came in 1988 when he was 32. He says, you know, but later I found out that he could get the papers here. So I came back from there. I worked on a farm. 
They wrote that I worked there for 90 days and I presented those papers to immigration. And his way into uh, America, like Gudas, is actually pretty circuitous. He said, you know, actually, I went to Germany for the first time in 1978. I was deported from there. In 1986, when I left again, it was when my youngest daughter was four months old. I went to Delhi. I left for Holland. I had experience from living abroad before. So I reached Holland. My friend was there. I reached Holland. I stayed in Holland for two or three months. I realized that I wouldn't get work there. My sister's son was in France and he asked me to go over there. I illegally crossed the border because I couldn't get the visa. People help you cross the border in a car. They take money in exchange. I went from Holland to Belgium, from Belgium to France, and then I took a train to Paris. Now, obviously, he got some help from family and friends. He said, you know, my nephew received me. I got work as a dishwasher at a restaurant. I had never done that in my life. But I had to for the children. As I was saying, I went to France and got work there and asked for political asylum there. I got work permit from that, and I was in France from 86 to 89. I worked there actually until 1988. I did make good money. I learned work there. I used to drive taxis in Delhi. I had problems there. I used to drive in 1984 during the riots. There was a lot of violence against Sardars. They burnt my house. Thankfully, the kids weren't home. I was home alone. They would kill Sardars by putting tires around their necks. They would kill Sardars. The Immigration Act of 1990. The goal of this act was to extend the deadline for legalization application for 1986 IRCA, also balance the need for professional workers and offer job security for the native born and restore American racial and ethnic diversity. And this goal of restoring racial and ethnic diversity is actually very interesting. It was argued that American diversity was jeopardized with the removal of the national origins quota by the 1965 ARCA. So while ARCA 1968 was touted as a watershed moment in American immigration history, it was criticized for its adverse effect on natives of uh, uh, various uh, European countries. And um, so this congressman Donnelly statement um, is actually rather revealing. He says, you know, the cumulative effect of the policy for the last 20 years has been to discriminate against any of the peoples who have traditionally made up our immigrant stock. Today, we have an opportunity to correct these imbalances in immigration and open our doors once again to legal immigration slammed shut on those nations that enjoy long historic and family ties with our country. Until 1965, there were three countries that um, formed like the dominant stream of immigration in the US, Great Britain, Ireland, and Germany. And he's lamenting the loss of that immigration stream into the United States and using it to argue that the diversity lottery program, which was um, solidified by the Act of 1990 um, that should be passed. And there were pro-Irish lobbies that were actually instrumental in shaping that diversity lottery uh, provision of the Act. So what's also interesting here, though, that while, again, they didn't want people from non-European countries, read non-white, to come to the United States, they also had to heed to corporate interests, interests um, that needed the labor shortages satisfied. And during this time, it was the information technology industry that lobbied for access to workers from overseas. So Congress placed um, initially a ceiling on the number of people who could come in through H1, uh, H-1B and then later caved to the pressure of corporate interests and had to give in. So again, we see this balancing act where the 
the diversity uh, program is trying to make sure that whites have primary access to the country. And then, of course, there is the labor needs that also makes it necessary uh, to keep open those avenues um, and through which we see people from the third world come into the country. Not a lot of uh, people actually in the sample obtained their permanency through this act, there were only two. One of them was the Vinder, who came in 1991 at the age of 30. He says, yeah, I got the visa, plus it was difficult to stay in Germany due to visa problems. There, once your visa expires, you can't stay. But in the U.S., you can somehow stay here even though your visa expires. If you don't commit any crimes, then no one bothers you, you won't be deported. That's the great benefit of this country. If you don't violate any laws, you can stay here. And of course, I talked to him in 2000. I wonder what he would say after the events of 9-11. Uh, he talks about strict immigration rules in Europe. He said, you know, in the U.S., the greatest benefit is that they don't ask you about your visa. That's why in Europe it's difficult to overstay. But other benefits are good there. Medical is free, life is easier, not as much hassle. In the U.S., life is fast. You have to work hard. Still, you know you can save money. You can make money. You can. And so what we see, again with this act is that uh, people from the developing parts of the world are sort of, they come in or they're needed as workers but not really citizens of the country who are seen as um, American, at least certainly not fully American. So how does this theme of race and class and race and economic interests follow the cabbies as they are searching for work and gradually becoming yellow cab drivers in New York City. What do the cabbies say? They talk about their own low qualifications as a reason for them to be driving taxis in New York City. And so this one person says, you know, I don't want my children to drive taxis. I want my son to work. We have a medallion. This is my only son. I want my son to become a doctor or an engineer. I don't want my child to drive taxis. This is the feel for those who don't have money and are not as educated. And then somebody else says, well, you know, if they don't have higher education, then they can't earn more money by driving taxis. So it's an understanding that driving taxis is possible if you have low qualifications and low qualifications limit opportunities in other jobs that are early mobile, that are middle class, identified occupations, and so you drive taxis, according to this group. So if they don't have a higher education, then they can earn more money by driving taxis. If one only has a high school degree, one can't find a job for more than $400 a week. 80% of Punjabis are only college educated. In addition, their education is from rural areas. For example, this Chandigarh College, Basically, they're not as educated. It's only graduation, meaning college degrees. One can't work on Wall Street or a bank with that kind of an education. Those who have other jobs don't make as much. Maybe they make around 400. Punjabis are hard workers because they have worked in agriculture. Paper, meaning not having adequate legal documentation, was given as another reason for why you find m m many more six um, driving taxis in New York City. These people don't have papers, so they can't do anything else. Immigrants don't have papers. There are a lot of people in the community who drive taxis as a result. Foreign-born status. They thought that because they were not born in the United States, this was the reason why they were driving taxis. I think the native-born are educated. They prefer computer-related work. When they become 18 years and are eligible to drive taxis, they are able to secure other kinds of jobs. They prefer other types of jobs. Even the native-born children of Indian immigrants won't prefer to drive taxis. Taxi driver parents will want their children to do something else. So they talk about their foreign-born status as a limitation in the job market, even though they have more education, more than a high school degree, than they uh, talk about with the, with the native-born um, youth in the United States. So although they have more, 
they actually have to drive taxis because their options are limited as people who are not part of this country, were not born in this country, rather. Race is given as another reason for why don't see too many whites. Maybe 1%. You see, even with a high school degree, they can get a job. They're citizens, so they can get a job. So overall, what I find is that the drivers offer their race, particularly their foreign-born or immigrant, immigrant status, and their social class as a reason for them to be driving taxis in New York City. And, um, this native-born white driver kind of uh, resonates what the sick cabbies say. This is Jack. He's 35. He had driven for six years when I spoke to him in 2000. And he says it's like, like I said, majority. He worked 12 hours and walk home with like 70 or 80 dollars. Not much. After lease and gas and stuff like that because of the pay. I know that a couple of their other white guys at Ronart, which is a fleet garage where the cabbies lease their cabs from, people quit. There used to be another white guy. He's a native New Yorker too. It's the pay plus the long hours. It's frustrating all the traffic and stuff like that. Not stupid like me, this is Dan. He was 65 when I talked to him, and he actually had been driving cabs for about uh, 19 years in 2000. So he says, you know, see, most Americans are not as stupid as me. They wouldn't come here. They wouldn't come and pay $130 and $20 in gas and go to work 12 hours and go home with 60. 12-hour shift. I went to work last night at 4.30 and came in at 3 o'clock in the morning. I had to borrow $67 so I could go to work. I didn't make enough money. Yeah, I had to borrow it. I got to pay it back. Interestingly, what the people, the Sikh immigrants, were responding to is this um, particular race and economic dynamic of the larger context in which the taxi industry existed. One of them was the demand. There was a demand for people to work in low-wage jobs and a product of race where improvement in the social class of whites meant that whites had moved into the middle classes of the society at the time. So there were fewer of them available to do jobs like uh, taxi driving. And in fact, some of the garage owners that I spoke with said that there were white drivers in the 50s and the 60s and that started to decline and we look at the history of race we do see that whites gaining that kind of economic strength and moving out of the lower strata of the society so it's a history of racial privilege also what happens uh, slowly is a deterioration in working conditions for cab drivers. So the job itself becomes very cheap. And that happens with this change from commission to leasing system in 1979, where drivers come to be defined as independent contractors. So now they're self-employed. They're no longer employees of the garages. They are now, as independent contractors or self-employed people, responsible for their own fringe benefits. They are not allowed to unionize well in order to negotiate some of the rules of their work. And their income over the years has actually dropped. So the work becomes cheap, cheaper labor needed. The economic conditions, the working conditions change, whites move out, there's vacancies created. Now, there's a supply side of the story. Around the same time when the switchover happens from commission to leasing system in the taxi industry, there's a change in the socioeconomic background of Indian immigrants. In the period immediately following the passage of 1965 ARCA, we see mostly professional immigrants arriving. And then in the late 70s and the early 80s, we see people arriving from the country who were not of professional backgrounds, were 
of lower than professional background. There's some research that says that it's really because the people who came in right after 65, they were professionals and they sponsored their extended families who were didn't have as much education. And so, you know, they came into the family reunification provision of 1965 Act. But when I talk with my um, group that I sampled, um, the sick cabbies, they did not necessarily fit that pattern. So even the relatives that sponsored them didn't have, uh, you know, much of a higher education than them. Um, so it doesn't fit with this group of Sikh immigrants that I interviewed. There were also co-ethnic networks, meaning like fellow Sikhs, who would direct newcomers into this occupation. So here you come, and initially they would do what I call odd jobs, like a gas station attendant, convenience store. Um, there was one person who worked as a florist, and that was very rare, and that's the guy who came here on a tourist visa to study and wanted to pursue genetics uh, PhD. But, uh, you know, mostly those kinds of jobs, and then gradually they would be uh, directed to taxi driving. So as they settled, as they got their you know, wits about them, the, the co-ethnics would direct them into cab driving. So they would act as, quote-unquote, supplier for the tax history. So again, we see that this group of immigrants, they're marked by race and social class. They feel that themselves, that that's really why they're in the business. And then they're also entering a business that needed more workers who were even lower offer, you know, provide that cheap labor, and also people who uh, mostly filled the vacancy left by whites because the upward mobility of, of whites was because really of racism in the country. So they left that vacancy uh, for them at the bottom. So people who came in were also primarily non-white. Well, so what was a driving experience like? They talk about being chased by race and social class even as they're driving taxis on the streets of New York City. So how does racism manifest for this group? So, you know, they do it less with whites. And here, this uh, informant is talking about police and the kind of enforcement of traffic rules on the streets as they're driving cabs. So, you know, they hate us. I don't know. They say that we're hard workers. They've come from far, they're making money. Maybe it's like that. I don't know why they do that. I've seen it many times. Last year, I got a ticket for turning on a no turn on 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. I hadn't seen the sign. There was a black Mercedes before me. He also made a right turn and I followed. The police officer was sitting on the right in his car. He stopped me, but not the Mercedes. This is uh, another person. This is the guy who came uh, to study on a tourist visa and you know he's rather hesitant to talk about racism he says you know the police I don't want to say anything their behavior is really racist they deal with the driver based on whether he's black white brown they favor whites they know that our people are money-minded they devote their time to work that's why we feel most pressure I can't give examples because I don't have evidence examples are like this that I've received tickets for doing nothing. In some instances, I may have been guilty and may not have been in others. And the same story of racism continues. And this person says, well, you know, because if Americans were driving taxis, they wouldn't have these rules. That's the reality. Because we're not born here, they discriminate. We feel this way because when we go, when we argue, some say, go back to your country. So they say, go back to your country. And they say, go back to your country. It's our country. It's not your country. Go back. That's why we feel that they're jealous and that we work and buy medallions. We work hard, we buy houses, and we help those in our own country. The city administration has been making so many rules. There may be a few drivers who have brought this on. We don't speak English well. They know that we can't say much because we can't communicate English. And the rules that he is referring to are really the strict rules on cab drivers that come down 
in the mid-1990s under Giuliani. And that affects the drivers significantly. And here's Ranjit, another example of what he thinks about being a foreigner. He said, you know, they think we're Indians. We're foreigners. Many customers inquire about my country of origin. I say I'm from India. They usually respond by asking why I work in the U.S. and not India. They say that the native-born are homeless, and yet we have a house. We wear good clothes, eat well, we own cars. This happens regularly. So he talks about how racism follows him as he's driving taxis on the streets of New York. Social class also shows up. And uh, they talk about their class sub uh, subordination for you know through similar sources. So they talk about mistreatment by police, the TLC, the taxi and limousine courts, the taxi and limousine commission courts, um, and the passengers. The taxi and limousine commission is the agency that uh, licenses, for example, all cabs in New York City. And this is Sukhwanth. He says, you know, the driver's status is low in society. And remember, he uh, used to be a bank manager in Lugiana, and so he presumably feels it a little bit more. We make good money, but that doesn't matter. Even though we behave well, our status in society is still very low. People don't consider this to be a good profession. As drivers, people speak to us in a harsh way. Police don't listen to us. Even when it's not our fault, we get tickets. One also gets passengers who maintain a different status. It's evident in the way they talk. When we go to TLC or any other of the courts, generally the judges don't listen to us. They listen to the police. At 77th and Broadway, people cross the street even when we're driving. I was going to cross, but the light red and so I blocked the intersection. I explained to the police who stopped me, the light was yellow and I got stuck. The police said, you were wrong. I got a $50 ticket. You know, that's why I feel this way. Gurinder talks about the elitism of passengers in particular. He says, you know, many people don't respect us. No one addresses us as sir. They call us driver. If we respond with yes, passenger, they get mad. They want an explanation for calling them passenger. But they don't realize that I call them passenger because they address me as driver. They address me as sir. I too will address you as sir. Some people do this. And this is Biju Matthew, who is an advocate with uh, New York Taxi Workers Alliance. He says, you know, the whole assumption is that if there's a receipt hanging out of the meter, you didn't give it to the passenger. They couldn't care an F as to whether the passenger asked for it or whether the passenger threw the money into the front seat and walked out. doesn't matter. The receipt shouldn't be hanging. Take the receipt out of the meter, and by some chance it crumples and falls anywhere in your cab, then you might be given a ticket which used to be $50. Now it is $150 range for an unclean cab. Okay. All depends on the cop you hit. I'm not saying that every cop gives you an unclean cab ticket, but I've known drivers who have received an unclean cab ticket because they found a penny lying in the back seat. There's an equipment violation rule. Say that if your seat belt is in the back, it's not properly visible, you'll get a ticket. Okay. And this is a frustrated garage owner, and I talked to him in 2000. And in 2000, because of those harsh rules coming down, you know, under Giuliani's administration, there was actually a shortage of cab drivers. So he says, you know, and you get the guy who's been driving for five years and has never had a problem, suddenly gets stopped at Penn Station and gets seven summonses. They say, screw you, and they leave the industry. All that they do is they find, they stop you for something, and then they give you, like, eight other summonses. For, let's say, the parking lane is blocked and so you don't park up the curb. Then you get a summons for picking up too far from the curb. Then when they stop you for the for that, they look at your trip card. It isn't properly filled out. They give you, you know, another two summonses for that on your trip card. And then they look at the assist strap. is a little loose in the back, and they give you a ticket for that. Some passenger slapped a sticker on the partition. They may give you a ticket for that. And it's just ridiculous. Stuff that's not a safety issue. A sticker on the back of the partition should not be a 25 or $50 summons. It should be taken off. Show somebody that it's taken off, and you are done. Consumer complaints uh, are also taken very seriously, and this is a taxi lawyer. And uh, this the lawyer says, well, taxi complaints run from the absurd, like passenger complains that the driver was rude and wouldn't talk to me, to serious things like assault. They're repeat complainants. They're stupid complaints. Some old lady complained because he wouldn't chat with her, and another complaint due to overcharge of 25 cents. Anybody can make a complaint. And this is Paravi at uh, New York Taxi Workers Alliance, Paravi Desai. 
that anybody can make a complaint. They, the call that we just got now was that the driver had a passenger and the motorist from behind him made a complaint saying that the driver, that the motorist witnessed that the driver passed by a black woman who was hailing a cab and instead picked up a white woman. So a quick recap of uh, the economic environment, which is um, what I ended with. Uh, what we see is that there's a need for uh, cheap labor as it shifts from commission to leasing. There are also fines um, imposed on the drivers to offer good service, focusing on the consumer, clean taxis, courteous service, safe driving, adherence to traffic laws. And what's Im important to keep in mind is that these kinds of um, money obtained from the cabbies is a major source of revenue. Right? So now what does the race environment of the industry say? There are reports of judges calling cabbies terrorists. They've also been called taxi terrorists. Criminal attribution. There was somebody from a spokesperson for the TLC said that most cabbies are rapists and murderers. There's also racial profiling post 9-11. So here's an example from the TLC courts. You know, the judge has made comments like about people like when somebody doesn't speak English, the judge will say, how long have you been in this country? Are you legal in this country? Why don't you speak English? Why do you need an interpreter? He's also made comments like, I believe that all drivers are liars, right? So broadly speaking, this when the drivers talk about racism and elitism, that you know they somehow feel that they are mistreated because of their race and because of their social class, of their lower social class in particular, they are also responding to a larger context that also makes those characteristics of them relevant. So their race is an important reason, you know, uh, uh, that they enter the industry and the racism that they experience on the streets and their social class, like treatment um, by the passengers, by the police, that they feel subordinated. Uh, on both those accounts and there's an effort to make sure that you know uh, consumers are treated better they're given um, you know good service and that obviously affects them um, the drivers as well in terms of the punishments that they receive for violation or presumed violation of traffic laws so are they accepting this society this subordination of racism and uh, their lower social class passively? I argue no. The drivers have figured out a way to improve their finances. Maybe it hasn't pushed them into the next social class higher up, but they have figured out a way to get make higher income than what the industry will uh, permit through the the, the money that they make while driving. So there are ways in which you can actually drive a taxi in New York City. You can work for a fleet garage and the fleet garage is where you go and um, you know they own large numbers of taxis, you go and pay money for a lease and you can lease out a taxi for a 12 hour shift. You can also buy a medallion or a vehicle and become an owner driver. You can also drive for someone who is an owner driver instead of driving for the garages. For this group of immigrants that I spoke with, a good proportion of them were owners of medallions or at least a car. And medallions are not cheap. When I spoke with the drivers in uh, 2000, it was like $225,000, and when I talked to 2008 9, it was about half a million. But nevertheless, 
good proportion of the sick cabbies were owners of medallions or vehicles, and or they were driving with a fellow sick cabbie. The way that they were able to purchase the medallions uh, is through formal loans, but also through immigrant resources like lending groups, rota rotating credit associations like community banking. They also received informal loans like from brothers, sisters, friends, etc. that helped them buy the medallion. And sometimes um, they can also be co-owners. So two people get together and they both put in money to buy the medallion. And driving with uh, a co-ethnic driver or you know driving for yourself was a very important way for this group to improve their income. Here's Herman, and he gives you some uh, ways as to w how this is a useful thing for him. He drives with a co-ethnic partner. He says, you know, usually it's a taxi driver who lives very close to you, you know? You start driving at uh, 4 or 5, so you have to wake up in the morning. So when you wake up in the morning, you can walk one or two blocks and pick up the car. It's difficult to live in Richmond Hill and go to Flushing. Flushing is like 100 blocks. Garages are not close to your home. I have to spend 45 minutes more. Then you drive to garages and park your car. Then there's a problem with parking. Then you have to pick your car. Those cars are maintained poorly because they're roughly driven. Again, after your shift is over, you have to go to the garage, return the car, then go home. Then again, you spend 45 minutes more, just more than one hour, right? So it's obviously very inconvenient for him. So the savings that one has, some that um, Harman uh, already tells us, the time saving to and from the garage, parking, money for parking, the hassle of parking, uh, the subway fare that other people talk about. But most importantly, the lease fees when you drive in these private arrangements is actually much lower. And what I found with the group of sick immigrant drivers that I talk with is that when they first start driving, they first start driving from the garage. And that's like the training ground. So, you know, you don't drive very well, and so you use the... Uh, cars from the garage to kind of get training and then after that you um, drive for yourself or drive with a co-ethnic partner and that is possible because of this kind of resource like uh, in the community itself that is available. They also had figured out a way to improve their race status and the way they did that is by accessing the positive stereotypes of Asian Americans. If you remember in the very beginning, I said that Asian Americans are viewed as model minority, and part of that model minority is that, you know, they're hardworking. And interestingly, that's the stereotype that this group uses in order to improve their psychological state of mind, at least. So he says, you know, we work hard because we have a lot of responsibilities like the families like we're going to take care of our children take care of our family and for our old age we need to you know save some money we are the hard worker people because we have a different culture and different thinking than these people Indians and Pakistanis or Asians in general are hard workers it may seem easy but this is a very hard job you have to drive in the snow and rain Indians like to work hard because it's only through hard work that one can make money. He, this one touts the honesty of uh, Indian drivers, along with uh, this consistent with this construction uh, image of them as hardworking. You know, Indian drivers are the best. The accident record and other kinds of record are relatively clean. Indian drivers are good. They're honest people compared to other drivers. That's why the garages prefer Indian drivers. They are honest. They don't cheat garages. People do cheat, but they're mostly honest with the garage. Other person says something similar. Because, you know, because our record is very good. We don't cheat people. We're honest. We do our work. 
we pay even when we don't make much profit. And that's kind of interesting because uh, paying is not an option. So if you lease a taxi, you have to pay regardless of how much money you've made, which was one of the complaints of one of the white drivers, Dan, that we uh, that I mentioned earlier. So, but he flips this and he says, you know, we pay because we're just good people. They also use uh, the common stereotypes of African Americans as inferior. And uh, some say, well, you know, black Americans don't drive either. They're Haitian. Blacks don't have to worry about money. They live on Social Security, they drink beer, and that's it. So it's like the common stereotype of African Americans as uh, living for welfare and just, you know, not really interested in working. That's really what keeps them at the bottom. And uh, this person said, you know, Indians discriminate against blacks, but, like, they're not good. They don't pay their fare. They prefer whites. Actually, whites hate blacks, too. And this other driver says, you know, blacks are just not good people, hence there's no black president. It's obviously pre-Obama. I'd like to go back and ask him what he thinks about that now. Um, and this one says, interestingly, so not just in terms of uh, using the Asian American stereotype of Asian Americans as being better as a group and uh, better than um, African Americans, but another way that they help themselves feel good about themselves is to characterize all Americans as lazy. You know, Americans are whites, don't drive taxis because they can't work hard. They can work in offices. Have you ever seen Americans drive taxis? They don't compete with Indians for taxi driver jobs. And this is kind of interesting in light of the fact that they think that driving taxis is a lower job and actually one person talks about it, at least one person talks about the fact that they really would like to work in offices, uh, you know, use computers, but they don't have that option. So here he actually, this other person flips it to say that, you know, those office jobs are somewhat inferior. Um, so that's why the whites don't really, you know, they can't really work hard like that. So. Here's this also weeness with the middle class South Asian Americans. So establishing alliances with the professional group. It's not racism, but it's more like they think we make them feel low. 80% of the doctors are from India. A lot of doctors and engineers are from India. They are jealous. So what we see here is that the six, the cabbies, are not passive. They are utilizing the tools of the society to make themselves feel good. So it's a psychological satisfaction. And then they're also able to make some improvements in earnings. So some concluding thoughts. What I want to reiterate is that throughout, they're marked by race and social class from the time they enter to the time they're getting a job, their experience on driving taxis, and the way they actually resist as well. And their method of saying that, you know, uh, they're better, and the use of the Asian American stereotype is indicative of their emerging identification as Asian Americans. But they also have a consciousness of uh, a lower social class. So even within the category of Asian Americans, and very specifically Indian Americans, they are trying to make themselves similar to the professional group. So there's an awareness of that as well. So that's really what I think is going on with the sick cab drivers in New York City, although that group does not dominate the industry anymore, at least not that I know of, but of the people that I've spoken with, and that's a really important qualification, of the people that I've spoken with, this is what I find. A minute to talk about the next uh, project. So my, with my next project, I'm moving on to transnational sick families and uh, looking at gender roles. I'm interviewing both in Punjab and the United States, and um, there's a documentary filmmaker that I'm working with as well. Her name is mentioned here, Shashwati Talata. And so I'm seeking both sick men and women to participate uh, in the study. So 